I'd like to begin by saying, that even though this is the last of the presentations that I'll be giving uh, at the Sinai and Daba here and in, in Cape Town, and it's really the end of the day, and you've been to all sorts of fascinating, inspiring, informative lectures and discussions, but the topic of parents and children is the most important topic of all. The foundation of our religion, unlike other religions, is the relationship between parent and child. What the Torah is all about, what the Torah is, is it's something to be given from parent to child. What few people realize is that the Torah is also something to be given from children to parents. And I'd like to look to explore with you today just what that means. How do we give our children, not just teaching words of Torah, but everything that Torah represents, values, attitudes, moral behavior, ethical behavior, and how do we learn these things from our children? How can we learn these things from our children? Let me begin by telling you why I say so insistently and so confidently that the most important thing a person can do is to raise his or her children in the way of the Torah. And if a person, for whatever reason, does not have children himself or herself, to teach in some way other people's children. I say so because the first Jew, of course, was Avraham Avinu, Abraham. And Abraham did many earth-shaking things in his time. Abraham was a, a figure of world fame, the world of his time. He introduced to the world the idea of monotheism, the belief in one God. This was a major ideological, philosophical, theological revolution. Until then, humanity were idol worshippers, were pagans. And he changed that. The two, two of the other major religions in the world besides Judaism, the so-called daughter religions of Judaism, Christianity and Islam, are both referred to as Abrahamic religions, because both in the New Testament and in the Quran, Abraham is a central figure. Abraham was a warrior, a general, who went to save his nephew, who was captured by enemy armies, and who defeated the enemy armies. So here you have a world statesman, general, top-notch theologian, and Abraham is known for his hospitality. He even was hospitable to angels. We're told his tent had doors in all four directions, in the east and the west and north and south, so that any wayfarer would be able to find his way into Abraham's tent. Abraham saved Sodom, Sodom. He prayed to God that Sodom be spared. God didn't Listen to him, but he tried, Abraham tried his best to spare wicked, wicked people from being destroyed. All these are marvelous things, and one would think that when it comes to God's recognition, and God has his opportunity, so to speak, to give a medal of honor to Abraham, he would give it to him because he brought the idea of one God into the world. He fought, literally fought, for what was right. He was such a hospitable person. The Torah says no. The Pasuk reads, Ki yada'atib. God says, I have known him, meaning I have cherished him. I cherish, I hold him precious. Why? Because he will train his children and, his, and their children after him to do 
righteousness and justice. God recognized Avram not for any of the headlines that Avram made in the newspapers of that time. Of course, there were no newspapers then. God gives Abraham special recognition, yedativ. He knows him in a special sense because Abraham is a parent, grandparent. Abraham is, as we call him, Abraham Avinu. He's Abraham, our father, patriarch, father. The avos and the imahot, the heroes of the beginning of our history, are our fathers and our mothers. Three fathers, four mothers. That's the most important role that one can play, and that's the first role that is played by our ancestors in the Torah. Moshe comes along, Moses comes along some generations later. He's not called our father. He's called our teacher, Moshe Rabbeinu. That's a lower level. As high as it is, father, mother, those are the most important roles in life from the Torah's perspective. The innovation that I've kind of uncovered in my own personal study is that even though we imagine that the relationship of parent to child is one way, unidirectional, parent teaches, influences, trains, disciplines, rewards, teaches, the child, but I have found that from the Torah's perspective, it is not unidirectional, it is bi-directional. Parent influences children, children influence their parents. Bi-directional. If you ever watched the earliest, earliest relationship of parent to child, a mother breastfeeding her baby, it's not just from mother to child. The child is giving something back to the mother. The child smiles, coos, cries, cooperates, pulls away, pulls closer. It's not a, a one-way feeding operation. It's a two-way operation. Watch carefully. Next time you can see that. The, parent, the child is just as much as involved in giving as in getting. He, she, the baby is giving to the mother as the mother is giving to the child. The Torah, too, we find that it's bi-directional. There are ways that the Torah prescribes a child must act to his or her parent. Famous, part of the Ten Commandments. Kabed et avicha ve'et imecha. Honor, respect your father and mother. But that's from child to parent. And from parent to child, we say in the Kriyat Shema, vishinantam levanecha. You must teach your children Torah. You teach another person's children Torah, that's good too. But it's still the older generation to the younger generation and the younger generation back to. The passage in the Talmud which deals with parent-child relationships in five or six folio pages in Masechet Kedushin, from the Chavtes onward, look it up. The tractate Kiddushin 29a and onward towards page 35b. And the Mishnah sets up this duality, this reciprocality, goes both ways. And the Mishnah says there are those mitzvot, which are mitzvot ha'av al habeim, the mitzvah from parent to child. And then there are those mitzvot habeim al ha'av, there are those mitzvot that go from child to parent. It's a two way street. That's the Torah, Chumash, that's the Talmud. And then the last words of prophecy that the Jewish people heard. Remember, we had many generations of prophets, beginning with Moses, arguably beginning with Abraham. And we had a whole chain of prophets, Samuel, Isaiah, Micah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, down to the very last prophet, his name is, unfortunately, among many people, not known. Malachi, Malachi, the last of the prophets. And what are his last words? The time will come, hopefully soon, when Elijah, the prophet, will come back to earth, and he will reconcile the hearts of parents with their children, the hearts of children with their parents. 
Heshiv Lev Avot, he will restore the heart of parents of Banim to their children, the Lev Banim and the heart of children Alavotam to their parents. That's the ultimate vision of the final redemption. The final redemption is not about Messiah. The final redemption is not about peace on earth. The final redemption is not upon restoration of the Holy Temple. For the last prophet, Malachi, Malachi, the, the final redemption is all about closing the generation gap by having this mutual relation, parents, children, giving and taking from each other. Fascinating. H how does that happen? Well, all of us function in a world, the so-called adult world. Some people call it the real world. It's the world where we earn a living, the world where we do our marketing, the world where we heal people and the clinics in which we work, produce items in the factories in which we work, trade in the stock market exchanges in which we work. When we are in those settings, we are on our best behavior. Why well, I want to keep my job, I've got to behave, I've got to suppress my temper, my irritation, my all my idiosyncrasies. I'm not going to show them when I'm out in the real world, in the adult world. When I come back home, I sometimes let those things go. I feel more comfortable. I'm home. I can do what I want. Sit as I want. Throw things around. Do what I want. And if I really let myself get carried away by my shadow self, my uh, uglier parts of me, and we all have uglier parts, I begin to show them in my family. I lose my temper at my wife. I scold my children beyond reason. And I'm sloppy. And I'm cheap. <laughs> and the various midot raot, the various negative character traits, that's where I practice them. I wouldn't do it in the clinic where I work or in the school where I teach, etc. The Torah is telling us is if you want to build your character and really improve your character, the place to do it is in your family. If you can learn within your family to control your temper, to understand the other person, to empathize, to put yourself in the other person's boots, whether the other person is your spouse or your children or your aging parents, Understand them, sympathize with them. That's the place where you build character. You don't build character out there in the adult world, in the world of the office, the clinic, and the factory. You build character within the intimate family, the intimate circle where you live. So, relating to your children, relating to your spouse, relating to your parents, relating to your immediate family, that's the, the crucible in which a person's moral and ethical character, sensitivity, generosity, ability to forgive, all of those wonderful things, the, the laboratory in which they are forged is the family. The family nexus, the family focus. Interestingly enough, the word for son, S-O-N, for child, because in biblical language, biblical Hebrew, and even in modern Hebrew, a son is called a ben, beit nun. A daughter is called a bat, beis tough. But when you want to speak of children generically, gender-free, just children, male, female, both, you use the masculine form, banim, rather than bano. Banim is the word which means children. And yet, you just change the pronunciation ever so slightly, and banim, children, becomes bonim, builders. Is there any meaning to that? That the word for children is banim, and the word for builder is bonim, almost exactly the same word with a slight change of emphasis? The answer is, our children are our builders. We get built through our relationship with our children. If we 
not careful and we lose our tempers, we do all kinds of stupid things with our children, first of all, eventually we lose our children, but we also lose an opportunity ourselves to become the moral, ethical, self-disciplined adult that we can be. If we catch ourselves in the relationship with our children and our naughty children, our misbehaving children, our hyperactive children, our delinquent children, if we can relate to them with maturity, we become built in the process. Our children are our builders. A very, very important lesson. There's a Hasidic Rebbe who used to say that we can learn three things from children, from a child, a little child. The three things you can learn from a child by observing a child carefully. Number one, he says, children are always active. Children are naturally active. Not every child needs Ritalin just because he's active and jumping and running around. Because it's natural for a child to be active. That's natural. In fact, if a child is not active, it often is a symptom that something's wrong. Perhaps depression, perhaps some hormonal disorder, some uh, maturational delay. A sign of a healthy child is that he's, she, he or she are active. Adults often are not active. One of the problems in the Jewish community, at least back in the United States, is obesity. It's fascinating. Jewish people tend to overeat and eat the wrong thing. A lot of carbohydrates in the traditional Jewish diet. Kugel being my favorite food. A potato kugel is uh, not a dietetic food. And by and large, traditionally, Jews don't exercise sufficiently. We're a People of the book, we're good at reading and talking, etc., but less adept at exercising properly. We need to learn from children. Children are active. Children, by and large, a healthy child will not be obese because he'll be running, even if he overeats, he'll be running or she'll be running around the playground, skipping rope or throwing a baseball or climbing a tree or whatever, and that keeps him healthy. Activity is healthy. So being active. Rather than passive, one thing one can learn from a child. The second thing is fascinating. Children are curious. A healthy child is curious. A healthy young boy takes things apart. A healthy young girl explores in the pots and pans of her mother's kitchen. Children ask why and when, <laughs> sometimes in a very annoying way. But children want to know. They want to know why and when and where and how. Children are capable of wonder. Children, a healthy child will say, wow. Wow, what a beautiful picture. Wow, what a beautiful mountain. Wow, what an impressive river. Wow, wow, wow. Adults, much less curious. They're all almost taught up adulthood. We become jaded, indifferent, ah, big deal, so what? Nothing impresses us, nothing makes us wonder. And for many of us, curiosity is something we gave up on a long time. We just say, this is the way the world is, that's human nature, that's the way it is. Why, why, why be curious about it? I came across, just last night, I'm reading a book, which is a study of the life and the writings of a man named Primo Levi, L-E-V-I. Many of you have heard of Primo Levi, know about him and his works. Some, some people have heard of him. Primo Levi was an Italian Jew, a chemist by training, who lived in Italy and actually got along fairly well, relatively speaking, in Italy under Nazi rule until as long as all of Italy was controlled by Mussolini and the Italian fascists. They were less viciously anti-Semitic, much less so than Hitler. But then the Germans took over the northern part of Italy, and Primo Levi lived in a city called Turin in the northern part of Italy. And at one point, when the Germans entered uh, northern Italy, he joined a group of partisans, tried to fight the Germans in various ways, and then was captured along with other fellow partisans. He and another fellow were the two Jews in the group of partisans. So the other partisans were treated as prisoners of war. 
and these two Jews were sent to Auschwitz. He was in Auschwitz almost two years, and he writes about his experiences. His books are a must read if you're interested in Holocaust literature. He's, some of his books are fictionalized, they're novels, but they're about Auschwitz. Some are narrative reports about his experiences. His very first book in America, I don't know how it's marketed in South Africa, but in the United States, it's marketed as Survival in Auschwitz. But that's not the title that he gave the book. The title that he gave the book is, Is This a Man? And he wonders, what makes a person human? Because everyone around him, his fellow inmates, prisoners, mostly Jews, were dehumanized. They weren't called by name. They were given numbers on their arms. They were starved and beaten and tortured in every kind of way. And humanity was beaten out of them. In one portion of that book, Bimbo Levy wonders, as the author, how did I survive? How could I survive? I asked myself. After I was in Auschwitz two or three months, and I realized that I was losing my humanity. Give some dramatic examples. You know what it means for me, Primo Levi? No one calls me Primo and no one calls me Levi. They call me, at best, Italianische Jude, Italian Jew. That dehumanizes me. Or they call me by the last two digits of a number of my arm. The last two digits of his number were 08. They call me 08. I realize this is driving me insane. I also missed conversation with people, reading, I'm an intellectual person, and everything else that I missed, including food, water, shelter, etc., warmth, etc. So I realized I, I've got to find a way to stay alive. And then I realized how important it is. If I'm going to stay alive in these horrible, extreme, unspeakable conditions, I must be curious. I'm going to start to be curious. Curious about what being human means. Curious about the motivation of other people. Curious about why one fellow inmate is surviving and the other one is wasting away. They're both subject to the same conditions. Curious, curious, curious. I kept my sense of wonder, and I deliberately asked myself, why, etc. It was almost an empty exercise. There was no reason to do it, except that curiosity kept me human. It was the one thing I could do to help me survive. And he attributes his survival to his curiosity. Curiosity is no small thing. Many, many great writers, in our tradition and in other faith traditions, write about what worshiping God is all about, what spirituality is all about, is the capacity to wonder. Manorama asecha Hashem. How wondrous God are your works. Ki ereshamecha maaseetz posecha. When I look up at your heaven, and I see your handiwork, this is what inspires me. To have a sense of wonder about nature, about beauty, about great accomplishments, about great geniuses, about brilliant poems, to look at them with a sense of wonder, wow, 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 that is the essence of spirituality. That's a channel to God, wondering, being impressed by the simple things we see every day, which are so wondrous, whether it's the sunrise or the capacity we have to walk and to see and to listen, etc. And we make brachot, we, we recite blessings over all these things, because a blessing is an expression of wonder. Wow, God, I'm tired. This is the fourth lecture I've given today, and in between the lectures, what I did was talk. So, so this has been my day. And someone was kind enough, wonder of wonders, to bring me, and it wasn't my wife this time, another fellow who brought me a cup of uh, cappuccino. Wonder of wonders. When I recited a blessing, Baruch atah Hashem, Elokeinu Melech Olam, Shehakol Nihiyeh B'dvoro, on this little bit of Nothing, a little bit of coffee, and, but it's a wonder. It's a wonderful thing. Coffee is a wonderful thing, right? 
Coffee keeps me awake most of the time. And it soothes my vocal cords, etc. It's something to, to, to write a poem about, to be inspired about. And that's what a blessing is. Primo Levi realized that Primo Levi was not a religious person in the traditional sense. He was a faithful Jew in many ways. But he didn't even know what a bracha was. He had no Jewish religious education. But that doesn't matter. He was in touch with the importance of curiosity. So the second thing besides activity that we can learn from a child, says this Hasidic Rebbe, is curiosity. And the third thing is, when a child wants something, he cries to his father, mother. When we want something, we must learn to cry to God. We must learn to pray, to ask God for what we want. It's fascinating. Many of you know, if you read all the propaganda about me, that I've had training and experience, many, many, many decades of experience in the field of psychotherapy. There's something amazing about the power of prayer. Usually when I used to function as a psychotherapist, I wouldn't teach my patients or clients to pray because I felt, well, that's, that's a rabbi's job, not a psychotherapist's job. But the research literature on the power of prayer to promote and to foster mental health, that literature is convincing. That literature is amazing. Besides the fact that we believe in a God who hears our prayers and sometimes answers them in dramatic, miraculous ways, besides that, the process of prayer is therapeutic for many, many reasons. Putting, taking all your tzoros, whatever it happens to be, physical illness, mental illness, problems with children, financial problems, etc., and praying to God for his assistance, is something in that stance. Oh God, I am your creature. I need you. I want you. And it's reciting the proper prayers. Heal me. Sustain me. Nourish me. Redeem me. Give me wisdom, etc. Bless me. There's something therapeutic in that. That's the, the lesson to learn from a child. When a child wants something, he cries for it. And he cries to his or her father, mother. We cry to our father in heaven. Avinu Shabbat Shaman. It's interesting that we can learn so much besides this from our children. Besides this Hasidic Rebbe, we learn these three things, activity, curiosity, and crying to one's father. There's another person, this is a name from the past, looking around at the audience, I can't really see you, the lights are shining. I see some uh, people who may remember this uh, TV personality, but many of you never heard of him. His name was Art Linkletter. Anybody remember a few people shaking their hands? Art Linkletter had this delightful television program called Kids Say the Darndest Things. Children say things that are just unbelievable. Wisdom. Out of the mouth of babes come wisdom. By the way, that phrase comes from the Torah. The Pesach in Tehillim in Psalms, Mipi Olalim V'yon Kim Yisarit Ka'od. From the mouth of suckling and nursing children comes all the glory and the strength. Children have amazing perception. And he published books based on the TV interviews he had with little six and seven and eight year olds and the wise things that they said. I can't remember the hundreds of wise things that Art Lingletter uh, learned from kids, the darndest things that kids say. But there's one thing that always reverberates in my memory. He went to, one, to several children and said to them, tell me, what's the best thing that daddy can do for you? What's the best thing your father can do for you? So one kid said he could buy me uh, toys of whatever kind. The other said he could buy me electric trains. And the other one said he could take me to the zoo or to Disneyland or whatever. And one child said, Mr. Linkletter, you know what the best thing my father can do for me is? He could love my mother. He could love my mother. Such a, <laughs> when you want to know what the best thing your mother can do for you or your father can do for you, the best thing a father can do for, is, for his children is to love the mother of his children. It's a, a powerful, powerful message that these days needs to be heard more and more and more. I notice a strange thing going on, right? Not going on at this very moment. All of the speakers have always had a young, generally a young lady who sat right there with those three signs, and the sign said 10 minutes, 5 minutes, and finish. 
I see the signs, and I don't see the young lady holding them up, so I can go on forever, right? But I won't do that. The way I figure it, it's about the 10-minute mark. So let me pick and choose for some other important things about parent-child relationships. And here, I draw upon my expertise. What's my expertise? It is not my Torah study. That's not major league. It is not my training and reading and practice of psychotherapy. I learned a lot there, etc. It is the fact that I, thank God, am a father. Not only am I a father, I have three children, I'm also a grandfather. Not only am I a grandfather, but believe it or not, because I know you can't imagine I'm old enough, to be a great grandfather. We have, Baruch Hashem, thank God, a number of, uh, of uh, great grandchildren. And in the process, I've not only learned how to be a father, of course, I've made plenty of mistakes along the way, but one learned from one mistakes, hopefully. But I've learned what it means to be a grandfather, which is a whole different thing than being a father. In fact, the uh, Christian thinker, writer, C.S. Lewis, you may have heard of him, said something which is a brilliant insight. He said, people want not so much a father in heaven as a grandfather in heaven. All right? <laughs> you know, our father is as wonderful as my father was. He could be pretty demanding, and he could be pretty tough, and he, you know, expected certain things from me, etc. But my grandfather, my grandmother, I could do no wrong in their eyes. Nothing. I was, I was, happened to have been the oldest, both sides of the families. I was, in many ways, a favorite. That's what I really like, a grandfather in heaven. Grandfathers don't say no. Grandfathers don't refuse. Grandfathers, you know, whatever. What grandfathers do and grandmothers is when the child gets a little bit difficult, they give them back to their parents. You know, <laughs> that's the secret of being a good grandfather or grandmother. You can spoil the kids rotten. When they start to misbehave, you just give them back to your parents, their parents, and fine. But great-grandparent, let me tell you, that's a whole other, whole other thing. Here's the young lady with the sign. Okay. They're looking for you. <laughs> Don't forget, we started about 10 minutes late. <laughs> it's interesting. Um, our oldest great-granddaughter is now nine years old. She's a little lady. I mean, she talks and obviously writes and emails and does all sorts of things. She's the one who teaches me how to use the little iPhone. You know. Really. I mean, she's the expert because she grew up in a different world than I did. He is growing up in a different world than I do. But I, when I first had my first uh, grandchild, granddaughter, great-granddaughter, I happened to be visiting a different city. I was visiting another city. It was Memphis, Tennessee. We speak there over Shabbat, and it was one of these long Fridays. And the rabbi who picked me up at the airport said, you know what, let's go to the local kosher restaurant, and we'll have lunch together. Rabbis never refuse a free lunch. So, of course, I went along. And um, he took me to this uh, restaurant, and right behind me in the line was a man, obviously a middle-aged, late middle-aged man, with a little girl. You know, I figured this little girl is not his daughter, it's probably his granddaughter. It's a mistake to assume that, <laughs> but I did assume that. And I said to him, oh, that's your granddaughter, right? So he said, yes, this is my little Uzi, or whatever her name was. And um, yes, she's my granddaughter, and she's visiting from some other cities. She's with us for Shabbat, and there's nothing in life like a grandchild. That's the best, he says to me. So I tell him, no, that's not the best. The man was about to get violent. Uh, tell a grandparent that the best thing in the world is not to be a grandparent, it's something else. He, he was looking at me, oh, what kind of a person are you? And I said, of course, what's better than being a grandparent? is being a great-grandparent. That's something unimaginably uh, You should also be privileged to, to live to that age and even to be great-great-grandparents. Nowadays, children are getting married younger, at least in, a, in, in some sectors of our community, and we're living longer, and, and you find grandparents, great-grandparents, and even great-great-grandparents uh, functioning and old, obviously, but doing quite fine. 
So some of the things I learned in this process are, number one, you never stop being a parent. My children now, obviously, some one of them at least, another one soon, uh, are grandparents. They're not babies. And Baruch Hashem, they're successful in their careers and in the community and they're active and they're wonderful kids, but they're killed kids. They're still my kids. They act to me as kids <laughs> and, and they still look to me uh, as father mother. Doesn't mean that they obey me, or, but nevertheless, I'm still daddy uh, to them. It's, it's something that never, never, um, never stops. Your children, from the perspective, they, they never grow up. My mother thought of me as a kid even when I was a grandfather already, even when I was a head of the OU, and all sorts of big honors, etc., you know, she still felt perfectly comfortable in telling me what to do, what to wear, stay warm, stay safe. By the way, Rabbi Becher here, I don't know if you heard his presentation about the Cairo Geniza. It's fascinating. So he really studied it, but I visited the Cairo Geniza uh, exhibit in Cambridge University. And there you find letters that Maimonides wrote in his own hand 900 years ago. And you have all sorts of letters that were really just personal letters, actually shopping lists from nine, 809 years ago, 900 years ago, from, from Jewish people to each other. So there's one letter, it's priceless. It's written in medieval Yiddish, so it's kind of German, Hebrew, Yiddish, all mixed together. It was written in the 1600s by a woman living in Jerusalem then, hundreds of years ago, to her son, who was living in Cairo, where the Geniza eventually ended up. And he's in Cairo because he's doing business in Cairo, and he's staying in Cairo many months of the year. And she sends him a letter from Jerusalem to Cairo. In those days, it's not an email. It's not even a, uh, uh, an airmail. It, it went over caravans and camels and whatnot from Jerusalem to Cairo in those days. In the letter she writes, my entire kind, my dear child. Now, he's a big businessman in Cairo, but that doesn't matter better to his mother. She says, my entire kin. I understand, she writes, that the weather in Cairo can be quite cold. Make sure you keep, stay warm. Now, the, and you can just see this guy, this big businessman and this merchant in Cairo reading this from his mother. And then, of course, she writes what all Jewish mothers write. Our neighbor, Soda, has a son in Cairo, too. And he writes to her every week. <laughs> and I haven't gotten a letter from you in four weeks. So that's all part of the things you learn from your parents. Many people, uh, I gave this lecture in Cape Town last Tuesday. It's interesting, even though it's the same topic and some of the same ideas, it always comes out differently. It's like my wife's uh, baking, you know, sometimes it comes out one way, always good. She may be in the audience or she may have said, I heard this speech already five times before. But it's always good, but it's always different. And it's, it's, it's the same kind of thing with lectures. Not always good, but they're certainly always different. That's what I experience. And, but afterwards, in, in Cape Town, several people came over to me, many actually, and said, Rabbi, can you recommend a book about parenting? Because, well, we'll speak for 40, 45 minutes. Must be much more to learn. Can you recommend a book? Uh, we Jews tend to think that all the answers are in books. You know, we're trained that way, and the, all the answers are not in books. But there are some very good books about parenting. There's one thing I found out about, about books. I don't know if you've experienced this. Even though I'm going a little off the topic, I have found that some of the best books are the ones that are long forgotten. The best books are not necessarily the most popular bestsellers. They're, they're good for the moment. But books which really are have a lasting, lasting importance are often forgotten. So sometimes you want to go back to books which go back 30 years, and parenting hasn't changed over the centuries. There's still obviously new twists to the challenges, but basically it's some of the same rules. One of the excellent, excellent writers on, ra on raising children is an Israeli writer who wrote in English called Chaim Genat. I always forget if it's one N and two T's, or two N's and one T, or two N's and two T's. G-I-N, maybe another N, O-T, maybe another T. Genat, Chaim Genat. And his books are all entitled Between, Between Parent and Child, Between Parent and Teenager, etc. So he says one thing that's really, really says a lot to me. You know the expression, 
when something's going wrong in the house, and uh, there's something, I don't know, there's a leak in the plumbing or whatever, and the wife says to the husband, don't just stand there, do something. Usually she'll end the sentence with something like, idiot. But don't just stand there, do something. You've heard that expression. Chaim Gannat says, a good parent understands, don't just do something, stand there. It's not what you do, it's being there. Being present, that's so important. Being there for the child. It's not what you do or say or what child raising technique you use. More permissive, less permissive, more strict, less strict. That's all important stuff, but that's not the main thing. The main thing is standing there, being there with the kid. Making the kid, more important than being there, making the kid realize you are there for him or her. Being there. It's fascinating to take it to a different uh, example of the importance of being there. I visited many years ago now this another city in the United States, far from where we, where we live. And I was there, and it's actually I was brought there to speak and to become familiar with the city had, at that time, many, many Holocaust survivors who were living in that city. And I was brought there to various reasons, and I figured these Holocaust survivors, they've been living in the city since just after World War II, and they must know a very, very famous rabbi whom I knew about, who was a rabbi in that city. And this rabbi wrote many advanced works about Talmud and Jewish history, and he was a famous, famous lecturer, etc., etc. I wanted to know more about his personality. So when I met these Holocaust survivors, then they were in people in their 60s, that just goes back 30 years or so, 25 years. So I asked them, did you know Rabbi X? Because Rabbi X was this great famous rabbi and he was world known, et cetera, et cetera. And they said, no, I don't think I remember him. Oh, yeah, one time I remember there was a man with a white beard who lived over there. I really don't remember him because he didn't, he didn't mean much to me. This is what they all were telling me. But there was another rabbi, his name I could mention, Rabbi Lustig. Oh, he was wonderful, terrific. I had never heard of Rabbi Lustig. He wasn't a famous scholar, he wasn't a world famous rabbi, he wasn't brought to South Africa to give him Daba lectures. But he was you know, plain old guy who was doing his job as a rabbi. But they said, This rabbi was always there for me. He was there at my son's bar mitzvah. He was there at my grandfather's funeral. One person said, I had an accident, it was in a car accident in the northern the northwestern section of the city. The hospital was in the southeastern section of the city, and this rabbi got to the hospital before the ambulance brought me there. That's how much he was there for me. And that makes an indelible imprint upon a person. You know, I teach young rabbis, I tell them, being there, being there, being there. But the same thing is true for the same thing is true for um, for parenting. It's not just doing something, it's being there for the person. I'm just given the finish sign. So I'll finish. Um, and I'll say that, speaking on my behalf, but I think this sentiment I know, because we've been schmoozing the other faculty who were brought here from Israel and from, from the United States and from all places in the United States and from wherever, we do schmooze with each other. And I could say on behalf of all of them, we came here, we tried to teach you, each of us in our own style, in our own way, etc., because that's what we were brought here for. But the most powerful impact that we could possibly make upon you is not what we do or say, not the stories we tell, or the lessons we teach, or the jokes we relate. It's rather the fact that we're here. We came from literally four corners of the earth to be with you, because this is a community, as far as I can see in the short time I've been here, where people are there for each other. People are there for each other, and that's so important. Don't just do things, be there. Thank you.